Our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed in the wind? If not, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in the king's palaces. Then what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has, none, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, friends. As you know, the weeks of Advent are marked by hope, love, joy, and peace. We light one of those candles during the four weeks of Advent. And today, as you know, is joy. And I don't know about a lot of you here, I'm going to guess, but... I think it's fair to say that it's been a rough year, right? Let's take an inventory here, shall we? Everything is merry and bright for you, right? And if things aren't merry and bright, well, they should be, right? Because after all, this is the most wonderful time of the year, right? Joy? I like the sound of joy, and I, I love when Carolyn and Drew came up this morning, Carolyn preached. I love, and this is what she said, I love that it's more than just feeling happy. Our, our notes are the same, Carolyn. It's more than just feeling happy. And I love that joy is much deeper and wider than happiness, which is only a feeling that is based on circumstances. You see, if you give me a, a good cheeseburger, I'm all happy. That's all it takes to make me happy. But the thing is, if you take that cheeseburger off my plate, I'm unhappy. And it's all it takes to make me unhappy, right? And the search for happiness is exhausting. Mariners fans know this, <laughs> okay? When they lose, we're happy. When they win, we're happy. And the season is 162 games. It's exhausting. Some of your days today, some of you here, your, your, your day will end either on a high note or a low note, depending on how the Seahawks play. <laughs> Thank God joy is something deeper and wider and richer than just reacting to circumstances around us. You see, happiness, it comes and it goes. It's so fickle, you see, but joy is a different thing altogether. Now today the candle of joy was lit and then Lisa came up here and read about John the Baptist in prison. And you do know how that story ends, right? Joy? 
You see, joy is right there when life is easy, and I have no shortage of, of joy during those brief moments when life goes the way that I'd like to go. So let's have a show of hands here. Who here can say life has gone exactly the way you've wanted it to go? I didn't think so. So let's look at John the Baptist. Let's look at everything John the Baptist had going for him on this day that we remember joy. Career. Check. John was the most popular preacher of his time. The guy drew hundreds of thousands of people over his preaching career into the desert to hear his message. What about his message? Did he have something to say? Check. Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Did he have a career? Yes. Did he have a message? You better believe it. Did he have an impact? We all want these things, right? Don't we all want our work to matter? John had that. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. Not only was he known for his message, but for his wardrobe as well. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Impact? Check. Guts? Check. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruits in keeping with repentance, and don't think that you're special because you have Abraham as your father. Guts, check. Status, he had it. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And then, as we read, Jesus called John the greatest prophet ever. He was also Jesus' cousin. He had that going for him. Status check. Now here's the thing about John the Baptist. By all measures, by all measures, John had done everything right. If there was anybody we could look to who had a career, who had a message, who had an impact, who had courage, somebody that had status, somebody that made a profound impact, it's John the Baptist. And if anybody on earth deserved a pass, it was John the Baptist. And yet our passage finds him questioning Jesus in a jail cell. And that's not the way things were supposed to go. Can anyone relate to this? Joy. You've been healthy. You've done everything you can to take care of your body and now you're sick with cancer or something else. The math doesn't add up. You have worked so hard on your marriage and it still somehow manages to fall apart. You've worked so hard, you've invested so much and your kids or your grandkids aren't who you thought they were. The math doesn't add up. Life, you see, it, it, it feels a little harder than it used to be. The days are longer, you ache more. You feel a little less yourself than you used to be. Joy. <laughs> Matthew's passage about the greatest preacher and prophet sitting in a jail cell, questioning Jesus, is a gift to anyone who struggles to find joy because life took a turn you never saw coming. Oh, joy. After Jesus, we read, had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent some disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And that's a fair question. See, the guy asking this question had just had his world turned upside down. The guy who had done everything right had just had his world turned upside down. The math did not add up. And two life-shattering questions we find here that John is wrestling with in our text. Number one, what now? 
What do I do now? What's John supposed to do? You see, he knows his role. He knows he's supposed to decrease. Remember that? It was John who said, I must decrease and he must increase. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. But is this the kind of decrease that John had imagined? <clears throat> Meanwhile, John has been faithfully preparing for the arrival of the Christ. And it seems like the only people who benefit from the arrival of Christ, it's not John. It's the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the poor, and even the dead. <laughs> Good for them. But I'm the guy who's done everything right and I'm in prison. Joy? So what do I do now? And here's the follow-up question. Who's Jesus now? Surely Jesus will open these prison doors and let me out, right? Surely you will change my immediate circumstances, right, Jesus? And we included the, this passage Verse 1 here, where, where Jesus is preaching in the towns of Galilee. Jesus should be going into Jerusalem, upending everything. But he's in the country, healing nobodies. And John's in prison, going, what next? And Jesus, can I really bank on you? Anyone ever wrestle with these questions? Life took a turn that in your wildest dreams you never saw coming. And nearly everything in your life is different now. And all kinds of questions are swirling in your head. But two seem to rise to the top. The questions Matthew 11 allows us to see as well. What now? And can I really count on you, Jesus? Or should I look somewhere else? There's supposed to be joy in here somewhere, isn't there? Fair questions, folks. Let's look at this from Jesus' perspective. How about that? Here's Jesus going. God incarnate. He broke through the darkness. He's going around preaching, healing the sick, raising the dead, pushing back the darkness, giving hope to the poor and hopeless, establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. He's on his way to deal with sin and evil once and for all at the cross. And John gets one curveball and all of a sudden has a momentary lapse of faith. That seems a bit askew, doesn't it? Jesus was born to die for the sins of the world. He knows what's ahead of him. And it's far worse than what John is dealing with at the moment. So if Jesus wanted to put John in his place and come at him with a harsh word and a rebuke, he very well could have, but we don't see that in our text. Instead, you see, he takes John's perspective and he reframes them. You see, to John, life and Jesus, they're not going as expected. And I think we all know what that's like, right? Right? For John, Jesus is not living up to his expectations as a Messiah. John was a fire and brimstone kind of guy. You can read about this in Matthew 3. John's looking for the fire that he was telling everybody about. Where's the overthrow of Rome, Jesus? Why are the bad guys still in power, Jesus? Why am I sitting in evil Herod's prison, Jesus? And instead of coming at him with a sharp rebuke, Jesus approaches him gently and he gives him two responses, right? He gives John a mashup of two passages from Isaiah about the work of the Messiah. And this is Jesus' way of gently telling John that the Messiah is very much here, is very much active, just not in the way John was expecting. The Messiah is here. Very much active. Sometimes not in ways you or I are expecting. You wanted fire and brimstone? Well, that'll happen later, John. But first, the blind get to see. The lame get to walk. The sick are healed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. Good news is proclaimed to the poor. God works in ways you see that we don't often expect. And I wonder if our expectations about how God should work often get in the way of what God is actually doing. Jesus, wonders John, your ministry isn't supposed to be out in the sticks healing nobodies. You're supposed to be in Jerusalem crushing everyone who opposes you. And Jesus, we would say, my, my life isn't supposed to have fallen apart. I've done everything right. 
You're supposed to protect me and heal me. I'm not supposed to feel this way. Where are you? And look at Jesus, the way he answers John. He said, I'm here, John. I'm working in ways that you're not expecting. There's a larger picture than what you're able to see. And this is what we can glean from this passage as well. Jesus is saying to you, I am here, child, working in ways you are not expecting. There's a larger picture than you're able to see. And so given all of that, here's what Jesus said. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who does not give up because I'm not doing what you think I should be doing. And this is Jesus' gentle way of saying, hey, John, I'm hard at work in ways you're not expecting. Hang in there. Hey, Christian, do you know that Jesus is hard at work in ways we aren't expecting? Hang in there. And we need to hear that message today. There's good news, folks. Jesus is hard at work in ways that we aren't expecting. And I I know you didn't plan for your life to take a turn, but that doesn't mean that God's not at work in your life. Blessed are you if you maintain your faith through this. And Jesus is saying, trust John. And trusting God matters the most when life doesn't make any sense at all. So blessed are you if you trust in this. So hang in there. And you see, if if Jesus is telling us he's working in ways we don't understand and he's calling on us to remain faithful, listen, there's got to be something worth hanging in there for. Something beyond, something greater, something deeper than what is just here and now. And you see, folks, this is where we find joy. Life is hard. And something greater is promised. Life is hard and the Messiah is working in ways we cannot see or understand or expect. Life can be incredibly difficult, but joy, it's still there. And so how do we live with joy in the meantime? That's what we're all going to wrestle with, right? Well, if we look at the text, I think it begins when we learn to follow Jesus. You see, there was a switch for John. A life of joy begins when we learn to follow Jesus. Now, some for the first time, and we're going to open that invitation at the end of the sermon, some are relearning all over again. And Jesus asked the people, who did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a softy, a fashion show, a prophet? Yes, that's who you went out to see. You went out to see a prophet. And not only that, he's the greatest prophet and he's the greatest human. And yet, Jesus said something strange about John. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What does that even mean? I think the key to this verse is understanding that John's role had to change. John can't be the headliner anymore. John must learn how to accept a new identity. His greatest identity. A disciple now. You see, it's not about John anymore. John's role now was to receive whatever Jesus had for him, whether he understood it or not. And I think there's joy in there. And once received, he must follow Jesus, whether he likes the path or not. That's called discipleship. And life is hard and unexpected things happen, and you know this. So we're given the choice. We can either dwell there Or we can choose to follow Christ and receive what he offers you. And this is how a disciple trusts. You see, the least in the kingdom, the the simplest follower of Jesus, who is willing to trust and obey, is greater than the greatest prophet and human alive. So you want joy? Joy begins when your status changes from greatest to least as a disciple of Christ. That's the starting point to joy. But you know how this story ends with John the Baptist. Follow Jesus, huh? Well, John followed Jesus and lost his head. Follow Jesus, huh? Didn't all the disciples but John die horrible deaths for their faith? Follow Jesus? You mean the guy who suffered and calls us to suffer for his sake? (laughs) What joy! 
There's got to be more to the story. I want to turn our attention now to Nehemiah. We did a study on Nehemiah a couple years ago. Nehemiah tells the story about how the torn down walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt after the Babylonians destroyed everything. You see, there was a disaster, which was the low point. There was rubble, which is the confusion and disorder. There was a rebuilding process. That's what Nehemiah is all about, about new life and a, a new identity for God's people. And after the city walls were rebuilt, Ezra, the teacher of the law, read the Mosaic law to the people for the first time in 70 years. And what happened? The people began to weep. Nehemiah chapter 8, all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. As they heard God's word read aloud, they were so convicted of their sin that they began to weep. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine doing our prayer of confession and you look around and people are just distraught about the week that they've had. So convicted of sin that they have no other recourse but to go, woe is me, Father. And that's what was happening. It was a revival, right? They heard God's word read aloud. They were so convicted of their sin. They, be they began to repent and mourn right on, their, right on the spot. They recognized that God is so holy and they are so wretched. And so this is terrible news. There's tears everywhere. It's not how they expected their day to go. And after listening and watching... Nehemiah steps to the podium and clears his throat and goes, Folks, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What a, what a sermon! So short, so powerful. And in their low point, Nehemiah stepped in and declared to the people, don't forget who God is, people. You're hung up on your sins, but the Lord is slow to anger and quick to forgive. And be sustained by this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. But what does that mean and how does that preach to folks whose life has fallen apart? Let's pay close attention to this. You see, notice Nehemiah didn't say, my joy, me, Nehemiah, see how happy I am? Be sustained by that. He didn't say that. He didn't point to himself. He didn't, he didn't tell the people to point to themselves. He didn't say, your joy is your strength. He didn't say that. He didn't say, your happiness is your strength. He didn't say, your circumstances are your strength. He didn't remind the people to look within themselves and find inner joy. He pointed and this is what a disciple does. This is what John is now learning how to do. He pointed to the Lord and said, His joy is your strength. His joy is untouchable. No curveball on earth, no circumstance that doesn't add up can touch that joy. It's limitless, it's unchangeable, and it's given to us. And we got to remember that when life takes a turn. Everything that God has ever done, everything he is doing that we cannot understand or see, everything God will do to redeem and restore for those who have placed their faith in Christ Jesus is good news. Joy is right there. Don't just be reminded of it. Bank on it and be strengthened by it today. So being, being strengthened by God's joy is, is kind of, I think it's kind of like this, okay? Here's my wallet. This is it. This is my wallet. I carry this, you know, it's a wallet. It's got my ID, my cards. But one thing um, you'll notice is if, if we go out to lunch or something, I always use a card. I, I rarely have cash on me. And my kids are like, Dad, you never have cash on you. And I'm like, you're the reason I never have cash on me. <laughs> but our, our joy... Our joy is kind of like this. I just, I just happen to have a small bill on me, right? This can only go so far. There's never enough. And our, our, our understanding of joy and our understanding is, of happiness is kind of like this. There's never enough, and we're always going to come up against something that is greater 
than what we can carry. So left to ourselves, we come up short every time. But when there's a high cost to pay, you see, too expensive for what this $20 bill will, will take. If I want to take my kids out to lunch or my family out to lunch or one of you out to lunch, 20 bucks isn't going to cut it. That's not even going to cover lunch for me. So that's when I remember I've got a bank account. There's more in that bank account, not a whole lot. But something greater is there. There are funds available that I have access to, and when the cost is too high, I have another source. And so I've got to make the decision, right? Will I try to pay with what I have? Will, will what I carry on me sustain me at this time? Will it, will it cover it? Will I, will I come up short? Or will I rely on what is kept for me in an, in, in an account to cover what I don't have in my wallet? It's simple, right? It's a no-brainer. You see, God's joy is present. So is heartache. God's joy is offered to sustain you and strengthen you and things will happen to you that will crush you and weaken you and it's just a matter of where you're going to make you withdraw from. If you choose to pull from what little you have on you, you're going to be broke every time. If you choose to withdraw, you see, and bank on God's joy and count on God's joy. You will be rich because there's more in there. There's more in that account. It's a lot and you're backed. There are funds available that you have access to and when the cost is too high, you will have to make the decision. Am I going to come up short or will I rely? Will I bank? Will I trust? Will I depend? Will I seek? Will I yearn for what is kept safe for me by God who offers his joy to cover what I don't have? Do you get it? One is going to run out. The other has no end. It is infinite. Simple, right? It's a no-brainer decision. And so this is our first takeaway, friends. Look, you know, on this Sunday where we light the candle of joy, that there are moments where we feel hopeless and sad. There are moments like John the Baptist, we sit in a dark place and we wonder, what do I do next? And Lord, are you even there? These are seasons. They happen. We do not dwell there. Joy is there. And at some point, you've got to make the decision to let God's joy be your strength, to let God's joy be your joy, regardless of how you feel. So the question you need to wrestle with is, what account am I withdrawing from today? Is it mine or is it God's? And number two, friends, and we'll end with this one, look. We of all people, we of all people, have every reason to be people of joy. You see, even though John sat in the prison of an evil man, Jesus reminded him of several things. Look, John, God is working in ways that are both unexpected and powerful. Trust that and hang in there. Friends, God is working in ways that are both unexpected and powerful. Trust on that. Hang in there. And know, rely, bank on that the best is yet to come. You see, John's story wasn't finished. John, you know, wasn't released from that prison. And he would later lose his head. And your story is not finished. You may struggle all the way until your death, but it doesn't end there. You may not be released from what troubles you, and you'll feel like you're losing your mind. At times you will ache. But listen, the best for John came after the worst this world could throw at him. The best for you, 
The best for those of us who bend a knee to Jesus Christ and trust still lies before us because God is good and you are his. So when life takes a turn you never saw coming, that's when you lean on God the most because his joy is your strength. Nothing can touch that. His joy is present and offered to you. Nothing can take that from you. It's just a matter of where you choose to withdraw, regardless of how you feel. Joy. So friends, if, if there are folks in here, and you're not, you're not here by coincidence, you're here because God's got something in store for you, but if you've never said yes to Jesus, I know you have been looking for something deeper in life. I know you've been looking for something. And I'm here to tell you, God's word points us to Jesus Christ. And if you have not made the decision to surrender everything you are to Jesus as your Lord, I want to invite you into that relationship right now. And the way we do that is to say something like this, to admit that we are sinners who need a Savior. And in that salvation is joy that cannot be touched regardless of what happens. So if you would like something deeper, something more, something divine, if you would like a relationship with Jesus Christ, would you surrender to him today? And if you have, let us know. You're part of the church now when we don't do this alone. And for the rest of us, may today be a day of recalibration where we are reminded to trust Stop leaning on ourselves and receive the Lord's joy as our strength. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for our time today. Thank you, Lord, that you are at work in ways we do not see. Thank you, Lord, that you are so gentle with us when we have our seasons and moments of doubt. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what we encounter here, we belong to you. And so, God, I pray, I ask that as we leave here today, we lean on you. We find joy in you and you alone. We trust you and we love you. And all of God's people said, Amen.